Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you today and to talk to you because I think by the end of the talk you'll realize you're one of the most important groups in the world if we're going to save civilization as we know it. Anybody who's at all alert, reading, thinking, is aware that while we're getting on with our daily jobs and businesses, uh, an enormous tsunami of our own making is approaching us with population rising to 10 billion people, with no real sign of, of sloping off, with us producing more than 10 tons of eroding soil for every human alive today when we only need half a ton of food, uh, with global finance in a shambles and driving environmental destruction, global economies in a shambles, many things we are managing. The pigeons are all coming home to roost and we are facing enormous threats, the greatest threats uh, globally that civilization has ever faced. With this rising population, global desertification spreading and ultimately changing the climate. I want to talk to you about just one component of that, which is 100% relevant to you. You are, your whole role, whatever part you're playing it uh, in the wool industry, um, is vital as you're going to realize. Now, I want to talk about the desertification component of this problem. Areas like this you see here in the biblical lands with a few camels on thousands and thousands and thousands of hectares of shifting sand dunes, these are grasslands of former times. These are not deserts, these are man-made deserts. Right? And that is a global threat now feeding into climate change in one of nature's loops, and that feeds climate change, climate change feeds it, and so we go on. Now, this is not a new problem. <clears throat> there are ancient civilizations covered by the desert sands that we dig out of the deserts today, all along the Nile. The only place that we've maintained civilization, which is city-based by definition, where we've maintained it for a very long time is Lower Egypt. Nowhere else. And it took the destruction of much of Sudan, Ethiopia, and Africa to sustain that civilization and send the silt down the river every year to the delta. <clears throat> Are we immune from this today? China's biggest city, Beijing. What is happening there? Is that city secure? No, it's no more secure than any of the cities in the past. If you read their documentation, the sandstorms are increasing in frequency and severity, and up to quarter of a million tons of sand are being deposited on the city in some days. Please believe me, nature will win if we don't change what we're doing. No city has ever survived that. Now, is it just sand blowing into our cities? No, as I flew into Cape Town, I took this picture out below the wing of the plane as we flew over amazing amounts of shanty towns. It's not just sand blowing into cities, it's people blowing into cities from environmental destruction, which is essentially the desertification that I want to talk to you about. Now, what extent of the world is threatened by this? Fortunately, NASA pictures can show us fairly easily, and I've marked in red the main areas of the world where desertification is extremely serious and getting worse and worse and worse. And as you can see, this is roughly two-thirds of the world's land that I'm talking of. Enormous areas of the United States up into Canada, South America, right across North Africa to China, 95% of that land, if you look at that big chunk across North Africa, can only support people from animals, not from crops. And everywhere that we look at is desertifying. Now, what are we going to do about it? Mine's not a doomsday talk. I came here to offer you more hope than anybody could have offered you, frankly, in the last 10,000 years. While this problem has been destroying civilizations around the world, 
and now threatens us globally. So let's look at what desertification is. It's a fancy long word. All it means is land degradation because ultimately if you let it go far enough you have camels and a few goats and that's it. You have deserts, man-made deserts. The true deserts are very small, the Gobi, the Narbib, etc. All right, so let's try to understand what desertification actually is, what brings it about. So here is the Tihama Desert in North Yemen. Now, I was with the World Bank team the day I took that picture, and we were very close to a research station. So we were able to see from them that 25 millimeters of rain had fallen as we arrived at the research station. That is 25 millimeters of rain falling. How much rain is that? If we think of it in drums of water, 200 liters, it helps us think a little differently. Well, that's 1,250 drums of water on every hectare of land. That's a hell of a lot of water. What are you going to do with it? Because the next day, that's what the land looked like. And we had to use the keys of the car to break the soil surface in the foreground there. So where had that rain gone? That is desertification. When your available rainfall becomes non-effective, it disappears. Now, where is it going? When we look at that bare covered soil and we watch that rain falling, we could see in the picture that some of it was running off to eventually become floods, if you give it enough of it. And the incidence of floods and the frequency and severity of floods in the United States and all over the place is increasing because of this, just like the dust storms are. Now, some of that water soaks into the soil, but as soon as the rain ends and the sun is shining on that soil, what happens is the water that soaked into the soil now evaporates out of the soil, just moves upwards, back to the sky. So all that rain that the Tehama man-made desert got that day was not effective. What should be happening is we should have soil covered. If it is covered, when the rain falls, the majority of it soaks into the soil because the rate of application of the water to the surface is slowed down. It can't flow easily, so you're slowing the application and more soaks in. Some flows off. Now, what does flow into the soil should only leave the soil in two ways. It should flow through the soil to springs, sponges, boreholes, wells, whatever, or to river flow, to maintaining river flow but flowing through the soil, not over the soil. Now, what doesn't flow through the soil and leave by that route should only leave through green growing plants. So fully effective rainfall, like we would have had over most of the world's grasslands, seasonal rainfall environments that we're talking about, the brown areas where the perennial humidity doesn't exist, it isn't humid every day of the year, right? In those areas, over millennia before mankind, those soils were highly productive, retaining vast amounts of water. The soil is the greatest reservoir of fresh, available water, greater than all the lakes, rivers, dams in the world, if we can keep the water in the soil. All right, so it leaves the soil through the soil being exposed. That poses the question, what exposes the soil on the scale that we're talking about of billions of hectares? We know what causes it. Sheep, goats, camels, you guys. And the producers you support, you're the cause of this. You've been blamed for 10,000 years. I was taught that at university. We all were. All scientists believe that. All governments believe that. All environmental organizations believe that. All farming organizations believe that. And keep trying to control the numbers. Carry the correct stocking rate. Don't carry too many sheep or goats or anything. You'll destroy the land. You know it. 
You know, we were once equally certain the world was flat. We were wrong then, and we're wrong again. What did it take to wake me up with this? I'm not a farmer by nature or anything else. I was a biologist. My passion was wildlife. Now, when I, as a young man, went to the, into colonial service, we started to set aside incredible areas of Africa as future national parks. And we removed the people from there who were gardening, drum beating, firing, muzzle, load going, muzzle loading guns, doing all the things you can't have in a national park. So as bureaucrats, we were good liars. We removed them for their own good because of tsetse fly. Total lie, um, because they'd lived with tsetse flies for thousands of years. But we intended to form national parks. Now, no sooner did we do that than the land began to deteriorate as we see there. Now, there were no livestock, no sheep, no goats, no camels. There was only elephants, buffalo, eland, kudu, all the rest of the animals. So, like a good scientist, I realized it has to be too many animals. Wildlife. It has to be too many elephants, too many buffalo. So, I did the research and I proved there were too many. Established the, the research, the data, it all proved it, because we scientists are human. We interpret data to fit our beliefs. We don't fit our beliefs to the data and realize that the data is telling us our belief is wrong. So I proved there were too many elephants. It was highly controversial because I said, we're going to have to start killing thousands of them to bring the stocking rate down to what the land can support. We had my work checked by a team of scientists. They checked it all. They agreed with me. We went ahead. We were all wrong, totally wrong. We shot 40,000 elephants to try to bring the carrying capacity down to what the land could sustain. And it got worse. It didn't get better. Now, that was a big jolt to me, how I could make such a blunder because of my scientific training, my beliefs, as all scientists have. So I really began my re-education over totally again, left government service, became an independent scientist, and said, I'll support myself in any way I can, but we are going to solve this problem. Now, when I got to the United States, I got a shock to find national parks with no sheep, no goats, no donkeys, no camels, almost no animals in this state. Isn't that as bad as anything we've got in Australia, Africa, North Africa, South Africa, China, anywhere? And I found people weren't even curious. They were just saying, it's a national park, it's conservation, therefore it must be good. That is terrible. Now, what are we to blame? We've blamed too many animals for causing it, but here we've had no animals for 70 years. And we've had millions of dollars spent on soil conservation measures and planting grasses and so on, and it just turning to desert. So what do you blame? Something must be causing it. Then I began looking at research stations around, sorry, the United States. Long ago, their range scientists intended to shoot thousands of Navajo sheep because they were causing the deserts to spread. So they needed evidence, and they put in protected plots and took all animals out of them, just like if you stop cutting your lawn, it grows, and the protected plots, the grass grew. They took the photographs, gathered the data, had the evidence, and they shot, I believe, 250,000 sheep. But the desert got worse, not better. And then they went to sleep, stopped inquiring, stopped questioning, just giving up. What do you know of that's going on in the world? Now, research stations like this that had green grass in 1961 by 2002 looked like that. Now, I got these pictures from the position paper of the International Range Society on climate change. And there is no explanation for this other than unknown processes. Something unknown is causing it. 
Now, what is your industry going to be based on? Unknown causes undermining it? Because you have no industry if you have no sheep. So are you going to do something about that? What are these unknown causes? This is what I want to offer you hope about. Let's look at what is really happening and go back in our minds to before it all started to go wrong. Here is a grassland on land we manage in Zimbabwe. And by the way, we're not just a northern sort of province of you. All you in America, I always say, all you Canadians, Americans make that mistake about Canadians. We're a different country altogether. And uh, we've got this big neighbor to the south. <laughs> but anyway, here's the land we manage in Zimbabwe. This is grassland, essentially, and these were the most productive areas of the world. All the great grain areas of the world, grain-producing areas, do you notice they're not former forests? They're all former grasslands, where that massive soil was built up with organic matter, water retention, etc. So here we have a grassland in Zimbabwe, in seasonal rainfall, it's come through four months of rain, it's grown extremely well. Now what happens? The rain stops, right now, about this time of the year. Over the next month, watch that piece of grassland and see what happens. Everything above ground, all the grass parts above ground are dying. They're never going to be used again. The plant is an underground plant. These are its leaves, shoots, flowers, stems, and the main plant is underground. So it's now pulling energy down underground, leaving some up there for animals, etc. And next season, after eight months of dry, it will try to grow again. But its buds at ground level cannot get sunlight unless something removes that grass. So that grass is dead now above ground, and it is going to kill the plant if it is not removed. So what removes it? If we don't remove it, it turns from biological decay. It needs to break down biologically. It turns to a chemical process of oxidation, like a rusting ship on the seashore, a rusting tin can. The outside of a thatched roof turns black. The inside doesn't. It's in sunlight, and it starts oxidizing. That is a very gradual process. That's why you can thatch roofs in the Cape with thatch, and why it doesn't break down in one year. So it's the same on the land. So this oxidation is now taking over. It's very gradual. It blocks sunlight from reaching the base of the plant. The plants start dying, you start getting bare ground, loss of soil, loss of water, etc., and woody vegetation moving in, which is all tap-rooted. And you see that all over the Cape and all over many countries. Now, for thousands of years, when people started noting this, they began saying, you have to remove that dead old material. How can you do it? Obviously, with fire. You burn it. It's gone. The plants can grow freely. But the fire led to atmospheric pollution. It led to ruthless exposure of soil and less effectiveness of rainfall, more floods, etc. Where do you think the great floods of Kruger Park are coming from? South Africa is getting terrible flooding in Kruger National Park. It's coming from your high felt grasslands that are just burning and burning and burning and burning. We justified that because the grass does flush green. So it keeps the grassland adult plants alive while exposing soil between them. All right, so how are we going to get rid of that old grass? Humans are tool-using animals. The number one tool we use is technology. Every single thing in this room, including the clothing you're wearing, was made possible with fire and technology every single thing in this room. You can't even drink water now without using technology, unless I tell you to drink water and you go to the nearest river and drink with your mouth. For thousands of years, we only had two tools, technology and fire. So what technology could replace biological decay? 
over two-thirds of the world every year. Come on, we believe in technology. Frankly, there's no technology even imaginable that can ever do the job. And yet we've tried. Every government is trying to use technology. It's not even imaginable that technology could do it and deal with that oxidation. Now, if the areas are humid enough and there's enough humidity through the year and thus the oxidation problem isn't as great as in the China, in the Los Plateau area, you can use technology and manpower, shovels, picks, bulldozers, and they have done an incredible effort of terracing whole hills, planting trees, using technology to plant the trees, using technology to, te to uh, stabilize the ground by uh, terracing, etc. That's where there's enough humidity. Now, where the same techniques are used in America, what happens? Where you don't have that high humidity. Doesn't work, and they've spent millions of dollars on it. Machines to mimic animals, to break the soil surface, crush the uh, vegetation and provide litter, reseeding, it's all failed. And what about the efforts in Israel, in the Negev desert? What I'm showing you here is costing 10,000 euros per hectare to build earthworks that you can see from the black lines, show them up a bit for you, to capture the water running off the soil, the runoff, and to grow trees. No growing trees is going to restore biological decay. And trees don't die from oxidation because they can shed their own leaves, which grasses can't do. That's why we call it fall, when the leaves fall. So magnificent effort, costing an enormous amount of money, not any hope of reversing the desertification. Meanwhile, they're removing the Bedouin sheep and reducing them, and paying the men an allowance based on how many children they have, and settling them in artificial towns. What do you think the unintended consequences of that would be to Israel? If you destroy the culture of ancient, proud Bedouin pastoralists and pay the men for the number of children they have, what do you think they do except breed? I had dinner with the mayor of one of the towns, and he asked me what the average age of his citizens was. And I said, I don't know, you'd have to tell me. And he said, they're 12 years old. Average age of his citizens. That's just a dynamite waiting to explode. Uh, United Arab Emirates, most countries, most people are doing the best they can. People are good, people are trying. And they're using technology to desalinate, irrigate the desert. You can see the lines of trees they're planting. And they've spent, I believe, I'm told, over $30 billion on 1% of the land. Frankly, the desert's not respecting it, it's just moving through. So, looking at our possibilities then, we have all of the tools here that mankind uses. We cannot do anything other than through a tool. All the creativity in the world can't do anything. All the labor in the world can't do anything. All the money in the world can't do anything until you pick up a tool. So I can have a beautiful tree standing here, terribly creative. I can picture the furniture I can make. The tree will just stand. I can bring all of you to creatively think, and the tree will stand. I can say, all come and join me. Let's claw at the tree with our labor, our hands. The tree will just stand. I can say, bring money and pile billions of dollars around the tree. It will just stand. Please believe me, as I said, you can't even drink water without technology. So all the tools available to mankind are here that we've ever used in the last 10,000 years. The only one I've left out is small living organisms to make cheese and wine, because we didn't use that for landscape management scale. So if we look at technology, None even imaginable is going to solve your problem of maintaining your sheep and saving city-based civilizations and businesses. Fire causes the problem of desertification and climate change. It's a major cause. Resting land causes the problem. 
as you saw in the national parks and the rested plots. Planting trees and grass can't ever restore biological decay. Many nations have tried that. So what are we going to do? Our tool bag is empty. To understand what we need to do, we've got to go back before we started agriculture, the production of food and fiber from the world's land and waters, which is what agriculture is. These vast grasslands of the world, where most of this developed, they were populated with incredible numbers of animals, billions of animals, numbers totally unimaginable to us today. That's what the key to it was. And those animals, those vast numbers of animals, didn't destroy the land because of their behavior, because they were accompanied by ferocious pack-hunting predators. The pack-hunting predators didn't come from the tropical forests. Tigers, jaguars come from there. They don't run in packs because they don't eat insects. And the main herbivores are insects. When you get into the grasslands, the savannas, the main herbivores are large animals. And then you get pack-hunting predators in large packs. And they're extremely ferocious. How did these animals protect themselves from pack hunters? Most of the females don't have horns in many species. They protected themselves by getting into large herds because the pack hunter is afraid of the herd. And when animals are in large herds and they're grazing animals and they're dunging and urinating all over their own food, they have to keep moving. And they cannot come back to that until it's fresh. It's weathered and fresh. And if we look at the science and not our beliefs, we find the science has been telling us all along. A Frenchman, André Vauzin, over 60 years ago, published in four major languages, showed that overgrazing of plants has nothing to do with animal numbers. It's got everything to do with how many days is the plant exposed to grazing and how many days does it get to recover before it's grazed again. Whether there's one sheep or a million sheep makes no difference except to the number of plants overgrazed. And the fewer the sheep, the more the overrest and the more plants kill themselves from resting. So this concept of stocking rate and you set the stocking rate, and if you're above that, you'll damage the land. Below that, you won't damage the land. That all governments believe in has no basis of science. It's only based on beliefs that assume scientific validity. All right, so if we look at those herds then that kept moving, we realize, okay, that would have kept cycling the grass biologically into dung, urine. That would have kept the soil covered, etc. So that is what we maybe need to do. And I put it to you now that, in fact, it is the only option. And no scientist likes to stick their neck out and say something is the only option unless you're 1,000% sure. I've been working on this problem for nearly 60 years now, and there is no other possibility than to use the very thing that was condemned most but managed differently to restore the world's grasslands. But we're going to need far more numbers of them, far more education and training on how to do so. So let's just test that idea a little bit. Here's this grassland we were looking at. What if we simulate in the foreground, using cattle in this case, just to imitate those herds of the past? So this big herd is going to move in, it's going to graze, and it's going to move on, and what happens? We find all of that dead grass is now covering the soil. It's dung, litter, or urine. Any rain falling on that soil now, 90% of it's going to soak in. 100% of it, unless it comes in a very heavy fall. And that is going to remain in the soil to leave through the soil or through green plants and that we see it doing, starting to flush again, and here's exactly the same scene after it's regrown. So animals did everything that we've ever tried to do with fire, 
technology, everything else, did it perfectly. All right, we first realized we were going to have no option but to use livestock. Cattle, sheep, goats, etc. And much of the early work began with sheep in Namibia and here where I was working with farmers because the land had got too poor to carry cattle in many instances. Now, how were we going to do it was a dilemma we faced in the 1960s when we discovered we had no option but to use them. We'd had 10,000 years of extremely knowledgeable people who had developed the breeds of sheep, goats, cattle, horses, chickens, all the stuff we use today. They had sat around their campfires. They had incredible knowledge built up over centuries. They knew their land. They knew their relationship to the land. But they caused the great man-made deserts. So herding the animals wasn't good enough. They've been doing that for 10,000 years. They're still doing it and the deserts are expanding. Then we'd had a hundred years of modern range science, fencing, grazing systems, rotational grazing, and that had accelerated the desertification. And the first people to spot that were South African farmers, who long ago said, we acknowledge that our land is deteriorating, but the deterioration accelerated with the introduction of fencing. And they were ridiculed because they weren't scientists, they didn't know what they were talking about, they did know what they were talking about. They couldn't explain it. Their observation was correct. So how were we going to run the livestock? When we faced that dilemma, I realized that it's no good reinventing the wheel. We ecologists, biologists, etc., had never addressed anything as complex as this the different soil types, the growth rates, the different plants, the different breeding stages of the animals, the wildlife, the crops, the other uses on that land. How can you sort out this complexity in nature? So I began looking at other professions, looked at Harvard Business School, planning business techniques, uh, looking for people who had at least planned very complicated situations and how had they done it. I discarded all the business techniques because they were way too academic, hadn't dealt with enough complexity, and you, it took so much training to understand them, and I doubted that they did understand them at the end of the day. And then I looked logically at the military, because armies of Europe for hundreds of years had keep developing their skills in immediate battlefield conditions. And you can't imagine anything more complicated than immediate battlefield conditions where things are going wrong, goalposts are changing, you're losing key people, you don't know what the hell the enemy is doing, but you've got to come up with the best possible plan right now. How did they do it? And I just took Sandhurst military training techniques and said, OK, I see how they do it. They just break the problem up into tiny little components that build on one another until the story builds and the confused, tired, wounded man, whatever he is, can break his thinking down into these little compartments and you emerge with the best possible plan. But armies had to plan for a week, a day, whatever, short battle. Farmers have to plan for a year, two years, where there's erratic rainfall or two rain seasons and so on. They had to plan four dimensions, time, area, behavior, all of these things, different dimensions. So it was much more complicated than battlefield conditions. So I said, all right, the army's not wrong. They've broken it down into that. All I need to do is to put it on a chart. And if I can put it on a chart that even a child can understand, so can a farmer. And that worked. We did that in the late 60s. It worked immediately, and we've never, ever had it fail because it had more than 300 years' experience behind it. We have had thousands of people fail to do it. We've never had any person who does it fail on the farm. And it literally can be taught in days. I have taught African school leavers in one and a half hours how to do it, and they've done a beautiful job. It should be simple. Armies developed it. All right, now that process we had in place by the 70s, and we were getting incredible results 
in five countries around here, around Zimbabwe, but we were also getting some failures. So we had to look at those and say, now what's going wrong? Because in science, we have to develop a hypothesis and then prove it consistently. This wasn't a hypothesis, this was management, but I said, let's treat it like a hypothesis and let's now see where this is going wrong because something is missing. And when we looked at it, we found it wasn't breaking down in the planning of the grazing. It was breaking down in social, cultural areas or economic areas on the same farm. And at that point, the name holistic came in. And in 1984, we got all the parts together and consistent results from then right across the board. When we brought together the cultural, social, economic and environmental together because they're absolutely indivisible. You cannot separate the hydrogen and the oxygen in that water. You can't separate the culture of a people from their land and their agriculture and their economy. They have to be treated as inseparables. So we got that in place with what we called a, a framework that brought the whole lot together. And it's simply, if you look on the left of this picture, you see the genetic way we've always managed. We have a simple context of need, desire, problem to be solved, whatever. Then we have an objective in our management, in your life, any, any business, any walk of life. And then we use the tools available to humanity, technology, fire, rest, etc. And we always make the decision on one or more of many factors, past experience, research results, expert opinion, cash flow, cost effectiveness, expediency, political compromise, whatever, and that's how you buy this jacket, buy this computer, whatever. All right? So we realized that the context was too simplistic for bringing together the culture of a people, their land, their agriculture, their livestock, and their economy, and we needed a more complex uh, context for our decisions if we weren't to have unexpected outcomes, loose cannons on the deck, we realized we had to add the extra tool to the toolbox of livestock without which we can't save civilization now. We can't stop global climate change. Even if we stop all use of fossil fuels, climate change will continue because of desertification unless we can use your sheep and the cattle and the goats and the things we need to put that right. So what we did was just come up with a holistic framework where we have a holistic context tying people's deepest cultural, spiritual values to their life-supporting environment to give us a meaningful context for any actions in management and the extra tool in there of livestock and that began working. Now we have young women like this one in a community in Africa. Uh, she's got very little education but she knows more about management of complexity probably than any professor in any university in the world. I call our senior herder the professor now because he's so knowledgeable about pulling complexity together, a really simple man. She is doing the same, just teaching villagers now how to deal with that complexity in their lives, uh, put their livestock together, begin healing the water, the rivers, the livestock, uh, the wildlife, everything. Simple maps, simple training, and it's beginning to work. Showing you more results, here's a bear spot that I know very well because this used to be on the road to my home in a large ranch I owned about 25 miles west of this and I bought this as a small ranch to put my staff on to keep the big place wild and I used to drive past here and it's been bare for forever. It was bare when I bought the ranch uh, over 30 years ago and it didn't matter what rain we got, it just stayed bare. And I've marked the tree there because literally we've done nothing here. No reseeding, no using technology, nothing except increase the livestock and plan the grazing. That's all we've done, that's the key to it. And there you see it changing to grassland. Here's another site, bare and eroding for years and years and years, no matter what the rainfall. Again, we've done nothing except increase the livestock and plan the grazing. And you can see we'd had over 30 centimeters of loss at the base of the small tree by the arrow. And there's the same scene after we've treated it heavily with livestock, doing the opposite of what we ever believed. 
In the past, we would have protected a plot like that. Now we just hammer hell out of it with livestock and the plants start growing. As long as we get the planning right, the timing right. Here's a shot in Mexico, and I had to mark the hill in the background because the change here was so profound after this rancher started managing holistically. As you can see, it's just totally changed the scene. And that tank dam, as they called it, that he was putting in to catch the runoff to water livestock, it doesn't catch water anymore. It's now going into the soil. Now the boreholes from the river are getting the water, not the runoff from the surface. In the Horn of Africa, which is a very violent region, we have pastoralists now training uh, on this. We're beginning this all over the world. And they are openly saying nothing that they can see will save their culture other than managing holistically. And here's a shot in the Karoo where that desert-like condition, we're just turning it back to grassland with one of the families in the Scrafronet earlier, years ago, down in Patagonia. Uh, it's the same. The man in the center here, he was for years a government research officer. He has all the data of them consistently destocking with the sheep, taking the sheep numbers lower and lower and lower, and the land getting worse and worse and worse. Finally, he learned about managing holistically. Uh, he's got involved. He's now a trainer. And um, he's on the land explaining this. And they put 25,000 sheep in one flock uh, on planned grazing. And they got, apparently, a measured 50% improvement in the animal performance and the land in the first year doing that. All right, so I just remind you that we're talking about most of the world's land here, the most problematic, the most violent areas. And if we are going to cut out all fossil fuels to try to save us from climate change, it's not going to work as long as desertification continues. And in any case, we have enormous problems to deal with of increasing droughts, floods, sandstorms, poverty, social breakdown, violence, recruitment to dissident organizations, emigration to our cities and into Europe uh, from these desertifying lands. And they're right through, as you see, from the United States to China. And again, I reiterate to you, nothing, nothing, nothing can save us except properly managed livestock and millions more of them. So the importance of this to your industry, I believe, is just mind-boggling. And as you, most of you, I believe, live in cities, please start talking. Because our cities are in the greatest danger. Throughout history, we have abandoned the cities. We can no longer abandon the cities. You are the greatest people in danger. I read over and over again, talking about the poor, poverty-stricken people in the rural areas. Don't worry about them. They still know how to grow food. Worry about the cities. The chaos, the suffering is going to be mind-boggling if the city people don't wake up to the fact that this is a city problem. It's not a rural problem. Because you control the politics, you control the money, you control the universities, you control the education. The rural people don't. So you control your own fate. Thank you.